Okay, so we have um, those who usually give the reads to us are not present, neither. Philip, nor um, Soraida. Can, can we, anyone volunteer? Wayne, are trying to I say can, something? I can uh, volunteer. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, beginning. Yes, uh, can you see the screen well? It's a good size. Yes, it's full, full screen. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Christians shall be recognized by their deeds. 16, not all those who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who has done the will of my father who is in heaven. Listen to these words of the Lord, all you who reject the spiritist doctrine as a work of the devil. Open your ears for the time to listen has come. Is it enough to wear the uniform of the Lord to be faithful servant? Is it enough to say, I am a Christian, to follow Christ? Look for the true Christians, and you will recognize them by their deeds. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Any tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. These are the master's words. Disciples of Christ understand them well. What are the fruits that the tree of Christianity must bear, that mighty tree whose leafy branches cover part of the world with its shade, but which as yet does not shelter all those who should gather around it? The fruits of the tree of life are the fruits of life, hope and faith. Christianity, as it has done for many centuries, preaches these three divine virtues. It seeks to spread these fruits, but how few pick them. The tree is always good, but the gardeners are bad. They have wanted to fashion it according to their own ideas. They have wanted to mold it in accordance with their own needs. They have cut it diminished it and mutilated it. Its barren branches do not bear bad fruit. They no longer bear any at all. Thirsty travelers who stop in its shade to look for the fruit of hope that ought to restore their strength and courage see only dry twigs announcing the coming storm. In vain, they look for the fruit of life on the tree of life. Its leaves fall dry. Human hands have You tampered with them so much that they have withered them. Therefore, open your ears and your hearts, dearly beloved. Cultivate that tree of life, whose fruits give life eternal. The one who planted it invites you to care for it with love. You will see it once again bearing its divine fruit in abundance. Keep it just as Christ gave it to you. Do not mutilate it. It wants to cast its immense shade over the entire universe. Do not cut off its branches. Its beneficent fruit falls abundantly to nourish hungry travelers who want to reach their objective. Do not pick this fruit in order to hoard it and allow it to rot so that it is of no use to anyone. Many are called, but few are chosen. This is because there are monopolizers of the bread of life, just as often there are of material bread. Do not align yourselves with them. The tree that bears good fruit must give it to all. So go and seek out those who are hungry. Lead them beneath the branches of the tree and share with them the shelter it offers. Grapes cannot be gathered from thorns. My brothers and sisters, distance yourself therefore from those who call you to show you the thorns along the way and follow those who, can, who lead you to the shade of the tree of life. The divine savior, the righteous one par excellence spoke of and his word shall not pass away. 
not all those who say to me, Lord, the Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who have done the will of my Father, who is in heaven. May the Lord of blessings bless you. May the God of light illumine you. May the tree of life abundantly shed its fruit over you. Believe and pray. Simeon, Bordeaux, 1863. Thank you. So this is the last message of uh, chapter 18. That is, many are called, by, but few are chosen. And I, of course, there is always a, a reason, a method by Kardec and everything that he does. Being um, a teacher of teachers, <clears throat> he uses a, a method, a pedagogical method on his writings. And he leaves this last, last message not by by, by accident, by gratuity of destiny, but he has a, an intention with it. And after going through this chapter, it's very rich in, in this message on how to, inside our limitations, of course, wrote how to accept the code and how to act in a way that we become one of the chosen ones. Which in reality we see throughout this reading that we make that entrance. It's not that someone gonna pick us, but we develop the merit to be chosen, to be selected. That we are not selected, we select ourselves basically through our, through our effort. And throughout, the, throughout this message, throughout this, this chapter, we see that action comes over and over and over again. You know, the whole teaching of, of Christ is a very proactive message. It's always let, telling us to do things, to perform the act of, uh, of charity, right? Benevolence, indulgence, forgiveness. We can put these three words, summarize the whole teachings of Christ in these three words, basically, right? And in order to do that, we need to unlearn and to eliminate a few vices, a few passions from us. And then all of those passions and vices derives, according to this book as well, from two major sources, selfishness and pride. And I think this message speaks about our selfishness and pride in itself. There is not enough to call Lord and Lord and to enter the kingdom of God, but only for those who has done the will of my father, right? That's come from Christ. And the will of our father is what? It comes from the when when um, the the lawyer of the laws of the day asked Jesus, you know, what is the most important of all commandments? And says the first one, love God above all things, with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your power, with all your everything, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So it, the will of our Father, what He wants from us, is exactly that. To love ourselves, to not to love our neighbors. In order to love our neighbors, we need to deprive ourselves from selfishness, from pride. We have to have a willingness to be indulgent, to recognize the limitations that others have as well. Others would have indulge, indulgence towards our limitations, towards our difficulties, towards our ignorance. And to be forgiven when someone offends us, someone falters with us the same way that we like to be forgiven when we do the same to others. By doing that, we fulfill the design, the, the intentions of, of our Father. And in the previous 
perfect and be, be strapped or be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect is to be complete in our duties as eternal spirit in this passage or throughout our existence with is to learn all that we all that is given to us and to put it to practice. And it's not enough, it does not suffice to call ourselves Christians, to put our label in our forehead, you no know, bright neon red, blinking, no, oh, I am a Christian, I'm a Christian, and act as if I've never heard of Christ in our lives. That it's not enough to associate ourselves with one or, or another religion or doctrine, spiritism as well, and carry that label without practicing what it, with it preaches, what it teaches. And, and it brings to us the, well, first of all, here it doesn't speak about religion. Throughout all this reading, Simeon does not say, you know, have this or that religion. Remember that there was one statement by, by one institution in the past that dominated the, the other religions. And, and one point that said, without the church, there is no salvation. And we had started this chapter already, and, and, and Kardec brought another statement, and without charity, there is no salvation. With the intention of eliminate the necessity of having a religion to be able to fulfill the will of a father. It doesn't say over here that we, not even that we have to be Christians, right? To fulfill the will of our fathers. By fulfilling our will of our fathers, who will be following the teachings of Christ with or without being Christian, with or without having a religion, with or without having a belief in, in this or in that. Personally, I believe that having this understanding that Christ is here as a supreme teacher that in his teachings encompasses all the moral laws that, are, that keeps us in a state of purity or leads us to a state of purity, it's a wonderful tool to have. If we understand that Jesus is the leader, is the model that God gives to us, and we are exposed to these teachings or not follow it, do I absolutely have to? No, no not necessarily have to, but as long as I follow those teachings, I'll be definitely um, doing the work that allow me to be one of the chosen ones. I think the Simon brings us the topic that specifically now in Christianity, then unfortunately, our pride of self selfishness, our passions, our desire to fulfill our wants and likes above all to fulfill our needs, we have throughout history kind of put words in Jesus' mouth, created dogmas using his name that has nothing to do with him, with his teaching itself. And I think the Simons bring us the, the alarm saying, go back to the simplicity of the teachings of Christ. Go back to what God of Christ really teach you, not what man is trying to teach you in the name of Jesus. Go back to the 
to the teaching of Christ itself in its simplicity. Without dogmas, without rituals, without that selfishness that put your interest above the teachings of Christ itself. Because by doing that, we run the risk of hurting the tree, the abundant tree that it plays over here. The tree that is supposed to give the fruits of hope, faith, of guidance. Let me see, I'm, I'm sorry, let me see who is you that I have to mute. Okay. We have, we run the risk of sterilizing that tree in a way that it no longer gives that, that, that fruit. And when the, um, the traveler who is thirst for knowledge looks at it, it doesn't find that hope. It doesn't find that certainty that by following it, it will stay safe, so to say. This does not answer the questions that the traveler says along the way. The very next chapter we're gonna deal now with, by design, of course, is deals with the power of faith and what is a true faith. We're going to start that chapter now when we see the necessity of associating reason to everything, including religiosity, including, including spirituality. Because the, the hungry traveler seeking answers, seeking, seeking better understand, when he looks at the three these days, he may not see it there. As we progress, as we evolve, of course, we become more developed intellectually speaking, and we have more eloquent questions, and we need eloquent answers for eloquent questions. We become more free to explore to you to allow our intellect to seek for answers. And it cannot be limited inside of dogmas that says, that's what it is, believe and that's it. The intellectual man does not accept that anymore. And when he looks at that tree looking for answers beyond the dogmas and doesn't find it, it's like having a sterile tree that does not answer, that does not, that does fulfill the objective of the tree itself, that is to provide those kind of fruits for us. So you need to be careful not to mutilate this tree with our pride, with our, with our ignorance, with our desire to fulfill again our likes and our needs beyond uh, our likes and our wants beyond our needs. Um, yeah, I think that's what I have in here. Any, any comments? Okay, so again, uh, <clears throat> And I think I'm going to talk that again when we go to the next chapter. This, this book, this doctrine, it really makes us to look at ourselves in greater depth, to analyze ourselves in, in greater depth. And for some that's scary, for, the, for some that is very challenging and, and I had 
cases, including in my own family of individuals who say that they chose not no longer follow spirituals because of this challenge. But that's exactly what this, this three is supposed to give us, to make us to be comfortable and to live with our limitations, but not be, to be limited by them, to understand that we are here exactly to expand this, to become capable to accomplish more, to do more. And when, and when we read, not all of those who say, Lord, Lord, we went to the kingdom of heaven, but only those who has done the will of our fathers who is in heaven. We may think, oh boy, when I look at myself, when I do a very serious, in-depth analysis of what I do more than what I am, I feel that I'm far from being one of those who has done the will of, of our Father who is in heaven. I think you need to be careful with that. Because indeed, that's the fact that we're here now, we are doing this. Because in fact, as Erasto says in the, in the Miriam's book, they know us. They know the struggles that we have. They know how much we're capable of doing. No one's expecting us to fulfill 100% the will of our Father in this reincarnation. This is a word of tries and expiations. We are here because you are know that, but not all that good yet. That is the truth. But to be consistent in the, in the objective, the ideal of eliminate to the best of our, uh, the best of our liberties, a little bit of pride, eliminate a little bit of selfishness, conquer the ability to do a little bit more of charity inside of, of limitations, of course, but seeking to expand ourselves in, 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 the, in the goal and the objective of practicing more and more charity, which of course, again, benevolence, indulgence, and, and forgiveness. If you do that, we'll be inside of that group who is fulfilling the, the will of, of our Father who is in heaven inside of the abilities of those incarnate in this planet right now. You know, uh, if we ask, if you take any topic in biology, I'd say, what is, a, what is a vegetable? And you ask someone who is, I don't know, five years old, there is an expectable, expected answer for that five years old. When you ask the seven question of 15 years old, we would expect a more eloquent answer. When we ask someone who is in college, we were, you expect an even more eloquent, advanced answer. And if you ask a botanist, you, you would expect to have an answer close to perfection, because that's how it is. We are right now, I don't know, the 10 years old. We're just starting now. So we should be able to answer inside our limitations. But understand that we are progressing, that we'll be able to do better tomorrow than what we do today. All right, comments? <clears throat> Elmo, this yes. is Carol. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, hi, good morning. Um, yes, the phrase many are called, few are chosen. For me, I like to expand it a bit more to say all are invited and it's up to the individual we choose. So that's sort of my expansion of that phrase. I don't know if that works for you or for anybody, but um, I find the first phrase a little bit stifling. 
Uh, yes, I think that works very well for me. Um, but again, uh, it's quite individual. And, uh, and I agree that we are basically the, the works of the last hours. So we had all been invited already. All of us were here sitting this and or anyone in Canada is planned today, but that's what's in my understanding. We have all workers of the last hours. So the, the months are already passed by and say, hey, come and work in my field. Now it's up to us to go. And it's not only to go, but to work. So that works very well for me as well. And we are all being invited. We all been called to work in that field. And the fact that we are now, I believe that you all have accepted the offer, the invitation. Now is to just have to do the work. And I like to believe that I don't do doing the work, being optimistic, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's it's a it's an equal opportunity whomever wants to do the work is not eliminated. Um, you know, it seems like the first phrase is a little bit more constrictive to me. So um, I, I, I'm in my own mind, I want to expand it to say, hey, it's, it's an open invitation. Yeah, it's your free will, yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. More comments now? Okay, so now we go to chapter uh, 19, Faith Move Mountains, and we're going to deal with the stops over here, but let's go straight to the power of faith. Once again, Elmo, uh, you want me to read? Yes, please. Unless you have any comment. You can read. Power of Faith. One, when he came to meet the people, a man approached him, fell to his knees at his feet, and said to him, Lord, have mercy on my son who is insane and suffers much because he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I presented him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Jesus answered, saying, O oh, disbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I endure you? Bring the child to me. And when Jesus threatened the demon, it came out of the child who was healed the same instant. Then the disciple came to Jesus in private and said to him, why could we not expel the demon? Jesus answered, because of your disbelief. For verily I say to you, if you had faith, as a mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. And, and nothing would be impossible for you. Two, in its proper exception, uh, it is certain that confidence in our own abilities renders us capable of accomplishing physical things that we would not be able to do if we doubted ourselves. However, here it is under here it is only in the moral sense that these words should be understood. The mountains that faith moves are difficulties, resistance, and ill will. In other words, all the things found among humans, even when it concerns the best of things. Everyday prejudices, material interests, selfishness, the blindness of fanaticism, and prideful passions are other such mountains that bar the way to all who are working for humankind's progress. Robust faith provides the perseverance, strength, and resources that enable us to overcome the obstacles in little as well as in big matters. Faith that is faltering provides uncertainty and hesitation with which strengthens, excuse me, which strengthens 
the barriers we wish to overcome. This faith does uh, the, uh, not choose the means to win because it does not believe in the possibility of victory. Thanks. So we start in the chapter that deals with faith, faith that move mountains. We have this passage that is Matthew chapter 17. That's a very known passage. The disciples were not able to cure the young child. They were not, not able to, as we understand today in the spirit years, operate a disobsession. In the case of Jesus, an instantaneous disobsession, right? By the expression use dead, remove the demon. And the, the disciples question why what can why you can do it so easily and we are unable to do it. And the answer to that is because of a lack of faith. If you have the tiny faith, the size of grain of muscle, you can move the mountains. And of course, Jesus was not simply talking about a physical mountain. He was not talking about the ability to conquer physical things. Although faith is very important, it helps with that also. In the very beginning of number two, it says, in its proper accept, acceptation, it is certain that confidence in our own ability and us capable of accomplishing physical things that we would not be able to do, to do if we doubt ourselves. I mean, it's... This, this belief, this, this, the certainty that we're capable of doing things allow us to do things that sometimes even surprise ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think all of us that went, go, went through the experience of learning how to ride a bike, of learning how to swim, uh, those who had uh, children and put them to those experiences, you know, start teaching them how to ride a bike, teach them how to swim. And those of us who have more than one child or associated with more than one kid at that same stage, had seen the differences of those who just climb on a bike and mm. absolutely faith that they got to do it and they do it much easier than those who fear, who doubts, who does not have that self-confidence that yeah, I can do this. It's, they will have greater difficulty in learning how to do those things. So even in the physical sense, that belief, that, that, uh, that faith of we are able to accomplish something helps us to accomplish those things. And the lack of that faith will delay, delay the accomplishment of those things, in some cases even not allow us to do so. I think we all had experienced um, ourselves or our kids that the moment that we develop that faith, that belief, Maybe because someone tells us, no, you can do it. Believe in yourself. And we take those words that come from inside and implement into ourselves and any change our state of mind and start believing it. We go and accomplish those things, even to our surprise at times. So having faith to accomplish things is essential, even in the physical sense. But of course, Jesus was talking about the mountains of the moral deficiencies or the moral like of, of the lack of moral qualities 
that allows the invasion of those uh, those things that prevents us from conquering our moral objectives and what he's talking about here um, the motto that fate moves are difficulties resistance and and ill will especially ill will you know the word all things found amongst human even humans even when it concerns the best of things and then it put a list of things here that you know if we look in depth at ourselves you'll see that those are the things that perhaps hidden us ability to like, expanding that that faith that believe and those things are the everyday prejudices material interests selfishness the blindness of fanaticism i think is a huge one and prideful passions things of that nature when when we talk about faith we we'll have to kind of kind of Try to define faith, right? What is faith? If we can. Just a second here. Most of the, the scriptures, the literatures that I have regarding faith, especially Christianity, comes from the Hebrew and comes from primarily from the from the Greek. And all those translations and for the Greek is pistes. Now pistes does means belief. But pistes more than that means fidelity. And very often, especially when Emmanuel writes and he explains that well in his own words, that very often that when we speak, that we speak of faith in God, very often is suggesting a fidelity to God. The word is the same in Greek. And also, another meaning for that from the Hebrews is to act in accordance to our beliefs. And I think this, to act in accordance to our beliefs, is the one that Jesus really emphasizes in his teachings, because again, his teaching is all very proactive, was to act, to do things, right? And to act in accordance to all beliefs. What is it that I believe in? Do I believe in a God that is all love and all justice? Do I believe in a father that is generous, that is good? If I have to believe, do I believe in a God that is always here for us, who always send help to us when we need it, who always provides to us? As in Jeremiah's, you know, look at the, at, at the birds, be more like the birds and the flowers that they do not reserve anything because they trust that God will provide. And <clears throat> Emmanuel, I read in Portuguese, I tried to translate, and I'm very, very deficient in translation. That's one thing that I, and the only thing that I always refuse to do in, uh, in my studies in spiritism when they ask me to do is translation because I do not trust neither my own English and neither my own Portuguese. And I think the translation is such a big responsibility that only those who as a really good domain of the, of the both languages and both cultures um, should be able to do a good translation. So one thing that I don't do is translation because I don't have faith, <laughs> my own ability to do it. And my fear that I will butcher it so bad and important message that I will do more harm than good. But I take my chances here and I go to the book, The Consoler. Uh, it's, I believe the translation is in, pro, in, in progress right now. If it's not completed, I haven't checked recently. 
and it, again, it's a book of questions that um, a group where um, Chico Xavier worked, they have put to Emmanuel and you just answer right then and there and they ask him if we could define faith, if could, faith could be defined. And, and he gave an answer that, that to have faith, not faith itself, but to have faith, is to have saved in our hearts, so sentiments, right, in our hearts, the luminous certainty of God is to have in our heart Saved in our heart, the luminous certainty of God. But a certainty beyond the religion's beliefs, a certainty that allows their heart to, to remain in, in a constant state of energy that produces divine actions with God. Therefore, Christ tells us, you are all gods. Now, he continues and then he says, to conquer faith is to reach the possibility and of no longer say I believe, but to say I know. With all values of reason immersed in the light of the sentiments. I think this is huge because now Emmanuel tells us the faith is not only of, of the sentiments, the innate faith, but it also must be associated with faith, with, with, with reason. And more important, it's not a given. It's not something that is there for us. So we speak of innate faith, right? Uh, in this book, they talk of innate faith is, is dealt with in which it says that the most simple individuals, the most simple groups, mm -hmm. They have that innate faith. They believe in the spirituality. There is something beyond the material. Just a second. Ron, can you lower that, please? But that is the ignition, is the start of, of that this faith that you have to build, that you have to conquer through our own work. Because Reason, intelligence, may trump that faith. And unfortunately, that's what has happened so often. The same way that intelligence, the intellect, they overpower, let's say, uh, instincts, you know? If the instinct of when, when you see a bear in front of you is to run, intelligence would now guide us. If you have the know-how and intelligence that Run is not the best of the ideas or all the things that you should be doing to try to make yourself bigger, mm -hmm. to make the minimums of noise and all those things that they teach us. Are we able to use intellect over power that instinct? If you do, the chance of survival that encounter is much greater, right? The, the instinct leads us to procreate, to, to replicate our own genetic generic pool. Intelligence may trump that. No, for this incarnation, I choose not to have children because of A, B, C, and D, and use reasoning to overcome that. The same thing, the intellect may trump this innate faith. And that's what comes to the previous reading that at one point we seek answers we're seeking for reasons to keep that faith alive within us. And we look for that three. 
And if you don't find those answers, those answers if that three is a sterile, it's not producing the foods they're supposed to produce, we, we may put, put that, dim the light of that fate, so to say, right? Because the fate needs a base, it needs a foundation to stand strong. And that, that foundation is the reason. Come to a point in our intellectual development that we need reasons even to sustain our faith. And that's where the study is coming in. That's when the application of science is coming in. I'm, I'm a, then it's my personal belief that science reveals God, instead of deny God and many think. I think all sciences and all sciences, they reveal God to us, they present God to us. That is one of the functions objectives of science, as you might understand, of course, is to reveal God to us. And I understand of the microcosmic and the macroscopic world, God is revealed to us, if we have the eyes to see, of course, as Christ has told us. Mm. So the, the mountains that we have to overcome is exactly those that shut our eyes to see the others are the evidences of the, the existence, the omnipotence, the omnipresence of God. If we have that foundation, in association with that innate faith that is provided to us, that the point of ignition is provided to us, then we can build to ourselves a state of faith that we no longer gonna say I believe, we're gonna say I know. But when I, I know, I mean, I mean, I know of God. I'm not gonna be crazy enough to say that I know God. Because I'm too far to comprehend God. We can better comprehend our, we can better comprehend ourselves. How can we can comprehend the absolute perfection? But we know of God and we know of the attributes of, of God as it's described in the book of Genesis. But for that, we have to use reason. Comments? Not can go to number three. In another acceptation, faith means the confidence one has in accomplishing something, the certainty of achieving a particular purpose. It provides a kind of lucidity that enables one to see it, though the end which is intended and the means to reach it in such a way that the one who possesses it proceeds in a manner of speaking, with absolute certainty. In either case, faith enables the accomplishment of great things. Sincere and true faith is always calm. It provides the patience that knows how to wait, because having its point of support in the mind and in the understanding of things, it carries the certainty of arriving at its objective. Hesitant faith senses its own weakness. When it is stimulated by interest, it becomes incensed and thinks it can supply the strength it lacks by means of force. Calmness in the midst of struggle is always a sign of strength and confidence. Force, on the other hand, is proof of weakness and self-doubt. In, in this reading, um, before I used to have a belief that 
Faith is something that you have or don't have. You know, it, there is no half faith, a quarter of a faith. You know, there is a, not a percentage of faith. You have faith or you don't have faith. But I think in this reading, Kardec's being more generous towards us. And, and, and I start to believe, start to change my mind here, that there is something that perhaps is an incomplete faith, perhaps. That's the word that I'm using here. Somebody may have a better word. When it uses faith that's faltering, provides uncertainty. And then to use um, hesitant faith, sense its own weakness. So he, he kind of qualifies the faith or disqualifies in this, uh, in this matter, so to say. That make me change my mind that perhaps we are in that state, instead of building that absolute faith that conquer their 100% faith. And for now, we still have a little bit of a faltering faith that perhaps still have a little bit of a resident faith. And when, we, when our faith falters, there's a good chance that we will fault the hour do we fault in our objectives, that we will not have the necessary will power that we may allow some of those mountains that we have within us, you know, the prejudices, the material interests, the selfishness, and very important in my opinion these days, you know, the fanatics and the prideful passions to overpower that faith that holds us on our way of truly fulfilling our objectives, noble objectives to, to act in accordance to the divine laws. Because personal interest, uh, material passions may get in the way. Because our faith is still kind of faltering, because our faith is still kind of resident. It says that here, his hesitant faith senses our own weakness. I think more than that, it's hesitant faith allow our weak, well, weakness to be stronger than our desire to stay in that path that leads to our happiness and happiness derives from being in peace with our conscience and being in peace with our conscience comes from obeying the divine laws or living in accordance to the will of our father over here. And I like when it says, sincere faith is always calm. It provides the patience that knows how to wait. I think that's a very important point also because I have faith that this is going to happen. But you want it, but you want it to happen yesterday. You expect that to, to be in accordance to our desire in our times. In itself, it, it shows that a, a faltering faith. <laughs> because as Emmanuel tells us, Time is God's greatest ally. And God does not, oh, and time does not respect the things that it did not participate on. Meaning that everything to be done and done correctly requires a certain time. You know, if you're going to bake a cake, you have to write, you have to follow the instructions. You have the right temperature temperature of the oven, you know, if it says 350 degrees, that's what you have to use. And if it says that takes an hour and a half to be ready, you have to wait an hour and a half. You're taking an hour and it's not going to come out good because mm -hmm. you did not respect 
the necessary time because you didn't allow, like, allow time to participate in that creation. You shortened what is supposed to be. But if you have faith, if I have faith in that recipe that I took to bake that cake, I will follow that one and a half. If I have faith that God is with me and God will provide all that I need to conquer this or that object, I will stay in that path for as long as it takes. Or be calm. I will not precipitate things. Or know that I will be hardship along the way. But I have faith. And I'll know how to wait. To me, there's a very important aspect in demonstration of our faith is the ability to wait. And that is a big one. That is a hard one. Comments, questions? Um, yes, Elmo, Carol here. Again. Yeah, one of the areas that I've had to work on uh, is actually more um, pragmatic faith, which is when computer glitches or computer problems arise at work, where I have no absolute no knowledge of repairing, I have to really let it go. I have to give it up to others who can help. And so the faith has to turn not from in, inside me for it to happen, but for others to help it occur. So I know it's probably not a great example, but I've had to stretch in that area of life because that used to be an area that, <clears throat> excuse me, caused me a great deal of stress. So that's the pragmatic faith. Thank you. Yeah, then I think it's a good, point when we take that in another point that we are we are codependent we are all codependent and I'm, I'm not good in everything I'm good in almost nothing but there's something that I can do no one is self-sufficient especially in a society that we live today Special societies use their technology. I mean, I am absolutely stupid when it comes to it, with technology. You saw the struggle I have last, last week to be able to present what I was to present. We have to have the faith that others are able to come in and association with us to make us better, to make me better. I need others around me are around me who brings what they are good at so I can be better than what I am right now. And if we have that faith in one another, there is, there is an exercise in the faith in God, in the faith of the divine providence. Divine providence will provide those who are able to assist me on that those who are able to elevate my potentials. That is an exercise of faith to God, is have that faith that God, with divine providence, has placed so many of us over here with different kinds of expertise, with so many different kinds of abilities that what enriches us, what make allow us to progress, to move forward, is exactly when all of us put our best effort to assist one another. Divine providence gave it to us. You know, it's God provides. I have to have that belief. But not in a sense of the miracle that will happen to me. God provides us then those who have that degree of expertise, that level of intelligence that I need, that I am deficient. And in association, I make that person better and that person makes me better. And together we make the society better. And together we make the humanity better. That is an exercise of faith in God.
And I think we're going to talk that on the next reading as well. So number four, please, um, Wayne. Number four, one must guard against confusing faith with presumptuousness. True faith allies itself with humility. Those who have it put their trust in God more than in themselves, because they know that they are simple instruments of God's will and can do nothing without God. That is why good spirits come to their aid. Presumptuousness is less faith than pride. Pride is always punished sooner or later by the disappointment and failures inflicted upon it. Okay, so that deals to me what we just talked about and, and deals with fidelity. That faith that Emmanuel explores uh, very often is that fidelity to God. Uh, if that certainty that God will pro provide way beyond all limitations to provide myself. We must guard against confusing faith with presumptuousness. True faith allies itself with humility. To being humble to that, no, I don't know everything. I cannot do everything. I'm very limited. And I am dependent on others. That's an exercise of humility. And independent on the will of God, that there are things that's way beyond me. I can do everything right by the book and still things not go well. What do you do when that happens? When you, when you go through the, I don't know, whatever your big object is, something simple as getting the promotion that you seek, you know, and you do everything right. You work, fulfill all your duties at work, you have a very proper um, behavior at work, you use all the right words, you do everything right, and you have the time that is required to reach that, and when it's time to get that position, your boss chose to hire someone from outside for whatever reasons, and you don't get that. And, you know, and of course, this is one example, but what do you do when that happens? What you have to do, you have the fight, fidelity with God that God knows better. When you take good care of yourself, we exercise properly, you eat properly, we sleep properly, you avoid excesses, you know, do everything right and end up with a uh, untreatable kind of cancer. What is your fidelity mm -hmm. with God? And how do you express your humility and fidelity with God in those situations? The presumption is that God will do things the way you want, where you want. It's just pure pride. It's not true faith. It's the you known the repeated case that you hear so often nowadays of the guy who is you know in his house and the flood is coming and the water is coming up and someone come walk and say let's let's go let's walk out of here because the water the walls are coming and the guy would say no nah, no worry god god going to help me god going to provide and then someone comes with a canoe when the water starts to rise again and Hey, it's time to go. The water is, is rising. You continue to rise. And the guy says, no, God will provide. No problem. And the water continues to rise. And then a boat comes and the guy is already on top of the roof now because the water has reached almost the level of the roof. And they offer him, let's go now because there is no way to come later. And the guy says, no, God, is, God will provide. And the guy discarnate the water reaches him and he drowns and meets God in whatever God is and you know, ask, I had all the faith in you. Why do why didn't you save me? And the guy will and God will answer, well, I sent the guy walking first, I sent another guy on the canoe, I sent another guy on the boat. What else do you want me to do? 
What is that? That's presumption is. God provides, but God provides through us, not through a miracle. To have that, that humility to understand that we are codependent, that God provides through us, you know, give us the honey, but use the bee to provide us the honey. You know, give us the carbohydrates, but use the potatoes, use the rice, use the sugar to provide the necessary carbohydrates that we need. Not through miracles. That is an exercise of humility right then and there as well. And fidelity. Comments, questions? No, Elmo, uh, would you think that um, a good exercise of, um, of making yourself aware of all the things that you, that are small, that you have faith in, I have faith when I'm driving that the, the car next to me won't veer into me uh, uh, intentionally. You know, uh, I have faith that the food that's at the store is fresh. I have faith that uh, the man I say hello to on the street won't punch me. Uh, uh, do you think, I don't know if all those, but uh, do you think all those little things, little acts of understanding faith and uh, will allow us to understand the, the faith in something so perfect as, as God, we believe in God because because uh, we don't, I think that if we think more about all those little things, the greater faith uh, might be easier to understand and to accept. Yes, I do. Uh, and I do when we, you stop to think of it, right? Because we have that faith, and by that faith is, I personally qualify in the, in the category of the innate faith, so the faith that are there already. That we doubt it, it would be impossible to manage our lives. That we doubt, we doubt it would be even pathological, so to say. The faith that, as an example, um, you work, right? And we plan to take vacations six months from now, a year from now. Nobody think, oh, what if I die before six months? What if I die next week? Maybe I'm putting this vacation for nothing. Nobody on, usually you don't think like that. Normally you don't think like that, right? We plan ahead for now. Most of us are planning for, for things way ahead of today, but nobody knows if we're gonna mm -hmm. go beyond today. Nobody knows if we're gonna go beyond the next hour. We all know that, but you don't think of it. We make plans for a year from now. When, as you said, when you start driving, you're not really afraid that there will be a drunk drive on the road. You're not thinking of it. You have faith that you're gonna drive following the proper rules of driving and everybody on the road will do so, aware that it may not happen, aware that somebody may make a mistake, aware that we are going to make mistakes, but we don't drive regularly in with the fear of mistakes because then becomes pathological. It's anxiety. Anxiety is exactly that. Is to have the pain before the pain happens. Right? It's, it's anticipate the the worst. It's not even normal. It's even pathological. So I categorize that in an innate faith that we have. They don't even think of it. But as I said, if we stop and think, we will see that it is an exercise of, of faith. It's a small faith in itself. That I'm making plans for vacation a year from now. That I'm making plans to visit my family, whatever, three months from now. I have that faith that I'll be there in three months. They'll be able to accomplish that. They'll be alive to accomplish that. 
it comes naturally. I put that on that block of the innate faith. faith. But if you stop and see, because there, there are things that is way beyond us. Even if, again, even if I do everything right, it may not work as planned. Because there is that component that is beyond us, is besides us. And you have, have the faith that that thing will be with us, that we will allow us to take vacation six months from now to go to, to watch that concert that you already bought a very expensive uh, ticket because you like that group, because you like that show. You don't think, I'm not going to buy it. I like the group, but I may not get over there. I may not survive this, this few days. That there will be a storm that day, and then and the show will be canceled. Nobody does that, right? It would be pathological. But when you look back and you reflect on it, as I said, and do exercise of thinking of that, you say, yeah, there is that component of faith. And that is something that you build, build upon. And to build upon, you need the updates, you need the foundation. And then where the reason comes, that's when the teachings of Christ comes as a tool to help us to build up that kind of faith that will allow us to no longer believe, but to know. Any more comments, questions? That was what Exactly what you were asking, right, Wayne? No, no. Yeah. Okay. okay uh, number five. Yes. Power yeah. of faith receives a direct and special application in magnetic action. Through faith, humans act upon the fluid, the universal agent, modifying its qualities and giving it an impulse that is irresistible, so to speak. Thus, those who combine a normally large fluidic power with an ardent faith can, solely by their will, directed toward the good, perform the remarkable phenomena of healing and other phenomena formerly regarded as miracles, but which are nothing more than the consequences of a natural law. That is why Jesus told his apostles, if you could not heal, it was because you did not have faith. So this now um, is a more specific aspect of faith that deals with in spiritualism called the passes, with in other sciences we call the magne magnetism, mesmerism, right? Uh, Kardec prior to encounter spiritists had already studied the works of Mesmer, had already witnessed the power of the so-called magnetic action, the power of, of the energies to modify um, situations, circumstances, to heal. And of course, it became fully understood by Kardec when he encountered the spiritism. But in this passage, it's talking about specific about passes that required faith, but not only the pass giver, but equally necessary for the passes receiver. beyond the the, what about the the pacified or the or of see just seeing over there and just being a receiver that is not so passive but also require that active exercise and the access active exercise exactly 
faith, a belief with, within reason, right? That we may receive um, energies that come from the spiritual world in association with the energies being provided by the past giver. But it's also absolutely, perhaps even more, by the past giver who has a more active action, more than the past, the past receiver, to have that faith, have that belief, have the understanding that there are matters in a state of energy that can be transferred from the spiritual dimension to the physical dimension that the past giver is able to receive from those who have the know-how to pass it through and to deliver to the intended guard uh, target, which would be the past receiver. It goes beyond just doing the movements that one can question if it's really necessary or not. I do question myself. I have read different things. I've read into some who believe now that not to give a good pass, we don't need to move our hands around, just put our hands on top of the head, you know, over the coronal chakra that the coronal chakra would receive that uh, energies and you would distribute to the other centers of energies as needed. Others will still believe, suggest that during the, the past we should put our hands to each one of those major chakras, again, major chakras or centers of energies. Mm -hmm. And that all those believe not even that's necessary, not even put the hands on top, just to concentrate our mind and think of that person and send our energies through thoughts is, is necessary. Uh, I personally believe that we need to do more research, physical research here to, to understand all that. But regardless, It's necessary to have that faith. It's necessary to have that faith that God provides to us more, more elevated spirits who have the know-how, the intention, the ability to concentrate those energies, to pass the, those energies to the past giver, and the past, past giver have the ability to deliver to, to the past receiver. That we have to have the faith in ourselves that we are able to be an instrument of the hands of those spirits to pass to those energies. That we, we can be used as a tool to make that delivery. That requires faith. But again, it requires faith that is beyond a dogmatic, ritualistic behavior. Oh, if I do my movements like this, like that. No, we need to understand that because I would not have faith in passes if I did not have an understanding of uh, a little understanding, let me be fair over here, in, in, um, the universe cosmic fluid, that primordial kind of matter slash energy that can't be um, manipulated by having the know-how, have the understanding, and have the faith as well to, mm -hmm. to serve others that that energy travels in its proper means of traveling the same way that air 
that our sounds travel through air, that it has its ways of going from point A to point B that our science does not understand yet. But it's not a just a faith based on a dogma, on a ritual, not because somebody said so. And I cannot argue with that. I have to reason using you know, what Einstein has provided to us already in association with our physical sciences that there is those energies over there. And if, and if those energies are out there, why they cannot be manipulated? They cannot be transported with an intention, not just going anywhere. They can be concentrated and guided from going, for, from going to point A to point B using the proper means of traveling. The, the faith that is associated now with reason allows me to be a path giver. In the same way, the path receiver should exercise that reasoning and the faith that they will receive what they need beyond of what they want and have the faith to wait, which is a big part of having faith. I'm not gonna go to the next, no, because it's a little bit longer, I have five minutes left. Any comments, any questions? I have a question. Yes. Hi, I'm Laura. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll scratch your throat. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. In one of the sentences, it says here, through faith, humans act upon the fluid, the universal agent, modifying its qualities and giving it an impulse that is irresistible. Then it says, those who combine a normally large fluidic power with an ardent faith uh, can solely by their will directed toward the good perform, perform their remarkable phenomena of healing and so on and so on. This is my question. Um, so there's the unit, there's the fluid that is within the universal agent. When it says in the other, the second sentence, those who combine, who combine a normally large fluidic power, that normally large fluidic power, is that the fluidic power that they're speaking of is within and around the person, or is that coming from the universal agent? Okay, yeah. That uh, make sense? That's a good point, thanks. Um, I, I spoke mostly about passes because this is spiritism and that's what we do. Here Kardec is talk more about mesmerism, about magnetic power. The difference between the two is basically that when we speak of mesmerism, we are talking mostly about of the ability of, the, of individuals to accumulate tremendous amount of those energies at the physical level. And, that, and more importantly, being to donate those energies. Yes, it is a manipulation of the universe cosmic fluid. It is. Some individuals uh, have an ability to combine those energies, to reserve those energies, and more importantly, have the ability to transmit, to pass it to others. That is more of, of mesmerism, of um, the works of mesmer, right, of magnetism. And that's more what they're talking about here. And again, Kardec was a student of, of this magnetism, of mesmerism. The reason that I speak more of past is because personally, I believe that even in mesmerism, in which we leave out the spiritual part of it, mm -hmm. I think the spiritual part is always present. Even if you don't speak of it, if you, if you don't know of it, I think those who protect practice mesmerism, uh, Reiki and other forms of energy passings that is not in association with as a spirit, with spirit, with spirit as a spirit is, um, teaches us, the spiritual part is always present. 
but here is specific to that, yes. You're talking about manipulation of the universe quantum fluid that some people has the ability to hold it to, to deliver more than others. The same way that some people have a more um, ostensive leadership, a more great ability to interact with the spiritual world than others, but everyone is somewhat of a, a medium. I think all, all of us has, uh, have the ability of transmit some, some energy, but others have more ability than we do. Okay, uh, Mike, do we not have a, our own fluidic? Uh, yes, we do. Our own, I don't know, uh, I forget the proper term, like our own fluids that are around us. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't call it a fluidic power. I forget what it's called in um, the other books, unfortunately, sorry. I mean, what do you mean by around us? Um, meaning that in our own makeup, we have our perispirit, right? Yes. And then don't we have some type of fluidic... Um, Reservoir? I, yeah, maybe, or, or some type of fluidic agent that is ours that is separate from the universal age, from the universal fluidic agent. Nothing is apart. I might be wrong. Yeah, nothing is apart from the universal fluid. The, the universe was the primordial uh, energy slash matter. So okay. everything derives from that. Okay, maybe I misunderstood it. Thank you for clearing that up. Sure. Also, um, Elmo Carroll here. Also, the past giver should not be drained by the process. It should be, I feel, the completion, the download, or whatever the assistance is from the spiritual benefactors. To me, that helps me to step aside. The energy is not my energy, really, but their energy. I happen to be there. That's it, basically. But we should not be drained by it. You know, I wasn't um, oh. referring to passes. Um, oh. I was just oh. referring okay. to us in general outside. Okay. I should have made that clear. Sorry about that. Oh. Um, just with us outside of, you know, passes for. Yeah, we have we sort of have the we have the right the, the the energies within us that expands beyond us and it surrounds us, so to say, and we are always being bombarded by all the kinds of energies and we pretty much choose which ones we are receptive to and ones we are not receptive to. In terms of past as part of the faith also is that that I'm absolutely convinced as a past giver, I'll be the first one to receive because I'm not all that good. In order to be a good delivery person, I need a little bit of of help for, from the spiritual world to allow me to, to do the best job that is, that, that is possible. That I will be the first one to receive as a pass giver in order to pass it to others. So no, I will not be deprived of anything in the exercise of charity. It would be a negation to the love of God when you are doing an exercise of charity. With, I could ask one more question. Let's say for the Q&A, we have two minutes over, if you can. Um, for those who don't get passes and for the, all those people who don't even do spiritism and they have um, overcome great things, you said they have been, either they've been healed, um, would they be directly um i guess directly have access to the universal fluid and manipulating it that way or yeah, divine, it that way to their advantage divine benevolence is not limited to those who, who believe or, be, or disbelieve in something is for all who are in merit to receive regardless of their beliefs
Thank you. Um, Carol, can I do your final prayer, please? Thanks, Wayne, for reading for us. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Sure, Elmo, thank you. Thank you, Elmo, and thank you, Wayne, for reading, and thank you, everyone, for participating today. Um, infinite creator and supreme intelligence, all goodness, all grace, we are grateful to be together again today for our studies of the gospel according to spiritism, our chapters being chapter 18 and chapter 19. May we plant seeds of goodness that offer and bear good fruit. Share these actions of charity and goodness with others. Cultivate all actions with love. Faith develops and overcomes doubt, uncertainty, and instinct. The heart and reason can enhance it as a base of support and calm certainty. Faith is a fluidic power that can be directed to the good and also to healing endeavors. This is a natural law. We humbly ask and receive the blessings of the spiritual benefactors and thank them for their endurance, for their help, for their guidance, and for helping us to uh, retain and remember the lessons given. May we continue throughout the week with our prayers, with our studies and mindfulness. And may we receive the love, light and peace of Christ within our hearts and within our minds. We offer our prayers and healings to suffering spirits in the physical world as well as the spiritual world. And we, we ask for guidance for all spiritist centers to continue their growth and expansion in the goodness and in the service of humanity. As we close our meeting today, we humbly ask for safety and protection as we return to family, friends, loved ones, and coworkers. May we go forth as beacons of love, light, 